Well, good morning and welcome to Lindsay Chapel Baptist Church. We're glad to have you here this morning. If you would, go ahead, grab your hymnal, stand. We're going to start off this morning by singing Glorify Thy Name, hymn number 249, hymn number 249. This morning from the book of Lamentations, chapter number 3, verses 22 through 26. It is of the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed, because his compassions fail not. They are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, saith my soul. Therefore will I hope in him. The Lord is good unto them that wait for him, to the soul that seeketh him. It is good that a man should both hope and quietly wait for the salvation of the Lord. Let's pray. Father, we do love you so much. And Lord, I just thank you for saving me. I just pray that everyone here this morning, Lord, who, who knows you as their Lord and Savior, Father, would just come here each and every day, not just when we're here, but... Father, every day, just praising you and thanking you for the blessings that you just pour out upon us. Lord, we do thank you for your salvation. Lord, we do know that your mercies are new every morning because your compassions really do fail not, Father. Thank you for being so compassionate and loving and merciful to us who can be so obstinate and hateful, Lord, and uh, yet you still love us. We do love and praise you, and we lift you up this morning. Pray, Lord, that you'd be glorified as we just sang, not only in, in song, but in everything that we do. We love and praise you. We look forward to what you're going to teach us this morning through your word. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. Um, I don't have any special announcements this morning, but we always do like to uh, welcome our first-time visitors. If this is your first time here with us, uh, we just ask that you just simply hold your hand up just for a moment where we can see you. Okay, I don't. I, we do have one back there. Good to have you with us this morning. Good to have you with us this morning, Les. Uh, we have something there that this young man is going to give you, and if you would just fill that out, please, and put that in the offering plate when it comes by, we'd be very grateful. Thank you. All right, our next hymn will be number 15, 
Come thou fount of every blessing, tune my heart to sing thy grace. Streams of mercy never ceasing call for songs of loudest praise. Sing it out, hymn number 15. Come thou fount of every blessing, tune my heart to sing thy grace. Streams of mercy never ceasing call for songs of loudest praise. Teach me some melodious sonnet, sung by flaming tongues above. Praise the mount, I'm fixed upon it, mount up thy redeeming love. Here I raise my Ebenezer, hither by thy help I'm come, and I hope by thy good pleasure safely to arrive at home. Jesus sought me when a stranger, wandering from the fold of God. He to rescue me from danger, interposed his precious blood. Oh, to grace a great a debtor, daily I'm constrained to be. Let thy grace, Lord, like a fetter, bind my wandering heart to thee. Prone to wander, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. Here's my heart, Lord, take and seal it. Seal it for thy courts above. All right, our last hymn this morning will be number 412. Go ahead and stand. In number 412, my faith has found a resting place. 412. My faith has found a resting place, not in device nor creed. I trust the ever-living one. I need no other argument, I need no other plea. It is enough that Jesus died and that he died for me. Enough for me that Jesus said, this ends my fear and doubt. A sinful soul, I come to him. He'll never cast me out. I need no other argument. I need no other plea. It is enough that Jesus died and that he died for me. My heart is leaning on the word, the living word of God. Salvation by my Savior's name, salvation through his blood. I need no other argument, I need no other plea. It is enough that Jesus died and that he died for me. My great physician heals the sick, the lost he came to save. For me his precious blood he shed, for me his life he gave. I need no other argument, I need no other plea. It is enough that Jesus died and that he died for me. The youth choir is going to make their way up before Dad preaches. They're going to sing, He Knows My Name. You young people, make your way up here, please. My uh, youth choir, we haven't got to practice a whole lot, but this is one of my favorites, and they're going to sing that. And I, I didn't get really permission, and since Jameson was up here for the last little bit and didn't say anything, um, he didn't do it, so I'm going to. We have a, a first-time visitor here. Well, not a visitor. We have a new member I don't believe they've brought Catherine until today, is that right? So we, uh, we want to welcome Catherine Noel Thought, future youth choir member, her first Sunday here, 
and uh, she's back there with Miss Kristen, and so uh, I know they're not going to hold her up or anything, but she's in underneath that little tent there, and uh, we want to just welcome her, and we're glad, uh, glad that God's blessed them, and I tell you what, labor's a big deal. If you haven't uh, <laughs> been a part of that, young people don't know uh, all the reasons they should respect their mama, but that's a big one, amen? <laughs> So, but we're grateful for her here. And another announcement I wanted to make, um, uh, Matt, Cowboy, some of us uh, fellas, uh, have a little event Friday starting at four in the afternoon. If you're a walker or a runner, uh, we're doing a Dwayne Hall Memorial Run. Now, it will go from Friday at four o'clock if you're a really brave, hearty soul, and maybe you want to get in, say, 100 miles in one day. Uh, Matt will be, um, Matt and I will be attempting this to basically stay moving the whole 24 hours. So if you can come for 30 minutes on Friday or maybe any time during uh, the day Saturday, we'll be out there doing loops and uh, Cowboy will have meat smoking, is that right? And uh, uh, fire and I know the weather might be a little chilly, but uh, if, if you're a walker runner, stop in at some point. We'd love to have you, and uh, we'll, we're just going to be fellowshipping. It's not a race. We're not running like uh, crazy or anything like that, except for the time frame. And so uh, uh, we did want to mention that, and uh, we do encourage you to continue to pray for the Hall family. Uh, we haven't lost Dwayne and Linda because we know where they're at, amen? Uh, but our kids are going to sing, He Knows My Name.
Amen. It's good to be in the Lord's house, and uh, let's all stand together. I hope you were um, able to be here for our Sunday school lesson this morning. It was, it was really good, and um, as I sat there and listened uh, to Brother Jim, this happened so many times, I was thinking so many of the things that he brought up um, were in my message for this morning. And um, so I, I know he hadn't read my notes, and so uh, when service was over, over because I'd been visiting with Brother Gerald this week, uh, even Brother Gerald said, that kind of overlapped, didn't it? Um, and I said, I love that because that's just the Spirit of the Lord um, moving, and I praise the Lord uh, for that. I want you to open your Bibles to Amos chapter number 4, Amos chapter number 4. Uh, and if you're uh, wondering where that's at, that will be just before you get into the New Testament, right after the book of Joel. And um, you'll, uh, if you don't know where Amos is at, well, uh, this is a good morning for you to know where it's at, visualize where Amos is. It's a very important uh, book. And so I'm going to share with you in Amos chapter number four, beginning with verse number six. And uh, you will be familiar with as I begin uh, to read this, and there is some repetition here in uh, Amos chapter 4, and the repetition is going to be that God gave Israel, through Amos, ample warnings of judgment to come, and over and over the Bible says, but they refused. In other words, they heard there was no excuse. They knew, and yet the Bible says they refused. And so if you'll look there in verse number 6 of Amos chapter number 4, <clears throat> the Bible says, And I also have given you cleanness of teeth in all your cities, and want of bread in all your places, yet have ye not returned unto me, saith the Lord. Uh, we talked about that word want this morning. The Bible goes on and says, And also I have withholden the rain from you, when there were yet three months to the harvest. And I caused it to rain upon one city, and caused it not to rain upon another city. One piece was rained upon, and the piece whereupon it rained not withered. So two or three cities wandered into one city to drink water. But they were not satisfied, yet have ye not returned unto me, saith the Lord." I have smitten you with blasting and mildew. When your gardens and your vineyards and your fig trees and your olive trees increased, the palmer worm uh, devoured them, yet have ye not returned unto me, saith the Lord. I have sent among you the pestilence after the manner of Egypt. Your young men have I slain with the sword and have taken away your horses. And I have made the stink of your camps to come up unto your nostrils, yet have ye not returned unto me, saith the Lord. I have overthrown some of you as God overthrew Sodom and Gomorrah, and you were as a firebrand plucked out of the burning, yet have you not returned unto me, saith the Lord. Now look at verse number 12. Most of you are in some part familiar with this verse. Therefore, in other words, um, remember what I've always said about the word therefore? When you see the word therefore, you need to see what it's there for. And it is a stark reminder, therefore, saith, uh, thus will I do unto thee, O Israel. And because I will do this unto thee, prepare to meet thy God, O Israel. Prepare to meet thy God, O Israel. Now, if you will, go to Proverbs chapter number 1 with me. Proverbs chapter number 1. Let me read a couple of verses to you there. Proverbs chapter 1. Um, the Bible says there, beginning with verse number 24, Because I have called, and you refused. I have stretched out my hand, and no man regarded. But you have said it not, all my counsel, and would none of my reproof. I also will laugh at your calamity. I will mock when your fear cometh. When your fear cometh as desolation and your destruction cometh as a whirlwind, when distress and anguish cometh upon you, then shall ye call upon me, but I will not answer, 
they shall seek me early, but they shall not find me. Prepare to meet thy God, O Israel. Now before you sit, let me give you a title. I think sometimes we can remember titles and then it helps us to remember the content of the message. A number of years ago, there was a lady staying with Miss Deb and I for a while, and she had mentioned that maybe she had heard in a message or heard somebody say that one of the problems in our churches today is that we are trying to be nicer than God. Now, I want you to think about that. Nicer than God. You see, when God pronounced judgment, he didn't soft shoe around about it. He said, prepare to meet thy God. In many of our churches today, we want to soften the message so that it will not offend people, and therefore we become nicer than God, and the church has been on a decline since we've determined that we need to be nicer than God. And so it's my prayer. It's my prayer for every Bible teacher we have in this church. It's my prayer for Pastor Clay and I that we would never attempt to be nicer than God, but like Amos, cry out the word of God, thus saith the Lord, prepare to meet thy God. Let's pray. Father, we are grateful, and we love you, Lord. And Father, we do want to be compassionate. We want to be kind. We want to be tenderhearted because, Lord, all those things describe who you are. But Heavenly Father, you're also a God who never wavers. God, you're a God who never changes. You're a God whose judgments are set from eternity past. Heavenly Father, there is a point at a time once to die, and then after that, the judgment. And Father, your word says that we are to prepare to meet you. Father, I pray that you would help us this morning to learn of you, that our hearts and our minds would be open for you to teach us what you want us to learn today. And Father, we'll just give you the praise in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. You can be seated. Now, I want to make sure everybody's awake this morning. Uh, sometimes when I get up behind the pulpit, it, it seems like uh, maybe everybody's not awake. So uh, if you've got a Bible this morning, I want you to hold it up. Okay, now reach over and hit the guy next to you in the head. No, no, not really. <laughs> Boy, I saw some wives getting ready to... I mean, the, the, you ladies caught on to that real good. This is a spiritual opportunity for me to lay one on him. Uh, well, and, and maybe it frightened the men enough that now we are all awake. The Lord said, prepare to meet thy God. I want to approach that particular subject, and especially the word prepare, on about three different points of view this morning, if I could. You see, at the time, uh, this time in Israel's history, and you can read this, it becomes very obvious as you read the Word of God, that at this time in Israel's history, the people had become very perverted and unjust. They were idolaters. They were oppressing the poor. As a matter of fact, I think it would be very interesting if you read Amos chapter 4 in your quiet time, and uh, if you do, uh, I'll give you a little bit of hint of something to look for. There is a place in Scripture where the Lord compares people to cattle. As a matter of fact, I want to go a step further, uh, and uh, I really don't know how to say this without somebody thinking I'm being a little bit arrogant or offensive or whatever, but actually there is a place in Scripture where the Lord makes a comparison to women and cattle. Not men, but women and cattle. Now, how many of you ladies are going, I don't know whether I really love that guy or not. I don't really know uh, after, after this, but I want to encourage you, you read the scripture and God will show you what I'm talking about. Now, some of you are going, why don't you just tell us? Because I want you to read the scripture. And then it will be, thus said the Lord and not thus said Pastor Turner. 
So Israel had become very perverted. They were unjust. They were idolaters. They oppressed the poor. They openly practiced idolatry. They refused to repent and turn to God. Over and over in the passage that I read, it said, but they would not return. They would not listen. They refused the word of God. So in Amos chapter 4, it seems that God had given more than enough time for Israel to repent, and yet they only refused again. But not only did they refuse, they became more and more rebellious and greedy and idolatrous and perverted. It was like the more grace and the more mercy that God would extend to them, the more rebellious they would become. And I think oftentimes that, uh, that almost characterizes America today. And although I'm only going to touch that for a few moments, I want you to try to look at this not only in the perspective of Israel, but in what's going on in America today. You see, the warning of certain judgment came in the word of prepare. It was like, oh, you sinful nation, prepare to meet thy God. It seems that God was saying, you have gone far enough. You have gone as far as I'm going to let you go. My judgment is inevitable. That means it is coming. Therefore, prepare. Now, I want to I want to broaden that word, if I may. And uh, in your quiet time, if you've got an old dictionary, and it has to be a real old one, I want you to look at the word prepare. Now, obviously, it will say something like getting ready. It was, you know, the, the obvious of prepare. But I want you to understand that there's another, another definition for it. And I just, uh, it was like the Lord put that in my mind, and so I grabbed the dictionary, and I didn't find the exact word, but I did find synonyms. The word prepare could also mean brace yourself. Now, I want you to think about that. Brace yourself. I've never played football, but my brother did one time, and they put him on the line. And uh, basically, he was a target for the guys that were much bigger than him. And I remember, as a matter of fact, he was kind of like, uh, maybe they didn't have all the equipment that they have today. Uh, now they've got all kinds of dummies mounted on uh, sleds for the big guys to run into and show how macho they are. But back then, they just put the little guys out there. And, and basically, what they would tell them is, prepare or brace yourself. Because there's something coming down the pike that has the potential to knock you off of your feet. And therefore, prepare or brace yourself. Now, do you understand that brace yourself and prepare can be synonymous in certain situations? Now, when we think about prepare, and I'll get to that in about the third point this morning, but when we think about prepare, we think we hear the Word of God, and uh, those of us that are saved, maybe the Holy Spirit of God pricks our hearts and makes us know that we're not living the way God wants us to live, and we know that judgment is coming because the Bible says it is appointed unto men once to die, and after that, the judgment. And so it's like the Holy Spirit is saying, prepare to meet God. In other words, you never know when, when the Lord's time time is for you. You never know when he's coming, so just be prepared. In other words, as uh, the psalmist said this morning, he leads me in the paths of righteousness. That's what the Holy Spirit is trying to do today for those of us that are saved, is lead us in the path of righteousness so that we will be prepared to meet the Lord. But I want you to think in the, the aspect of bracing yourself because something is coming. Now, I also, uh, as I looked in the dictionary, I, I noticed something else. Not only brace yourself, but stand erect. Stand straight up. How many of you are old enough to remember in school when posture was somewhat important? Y'all remember that? Do this. Okay, that meant that if you were walking down the hallway and you were slumping and the principal would literally walk up to you. I remember back then, you, you'd get put in jail today for some of the things they did to us back then. I remember a principal that would walk up behind you and kind of help you stand upright. 
You might say, are you kidding me? No. No, it was nothing unusual. We had teachers that carried these, y'all heard me tell this, haven't you? These rulers, and they were wood, and they had a little, they had a little metal deal going down the side of them. They were a one-foot ruler that were three foot long. And they could reach out and get you. And they made you set up straight. They made you have posture. In other words, it was like, be prepared for what I'm getting ready to try to teach you. Pay attention. Did you know that that's one of the definitions? It means to stand erect. It means to stand perpendicular, if you will. Now, the Lord said, after he had given Israel time and time and time to repent, he had showed them his mighty miracles as he delivered them out of Egypt. He had shown them his care over them as he led them through and fed them. As Brother Jim mentioned this morning, he literally fed them day by day. They had seen all of those great miracles of God, and yet they continued in their perverse, rebellious, idolatrous, covetous ways. And the Lord finally said, brace yourself Oh, Israel, something is getting ready to happen. When I think about standing upright, standing straight up, I believe that God was saying to them, you have braced yourself against my mercy and grace. You have stood straight up face to face with me and rejected the mercy and grace that I poured out. You've rejected the warnings that I've given you, standing and looking me in the face. Folks, let me tell you this. I believe that there is a likeness here. We see in America today the leadership of our country in many ways are standing perpendicular. They are standing straight up, sticking their chest out, and not only ignoring God, but mouthing back at God and shaking our fist in the face of God. But let me tell you this. We better brace ourselves because He is God. We are not. He is omnipotent. We are literally ants in His eyesight. And He said, brace yourself. You had better beware. I know that big shots don't listen to Lindsay Chapel online, but just in case there's any big shot listening to us out there, can I tell you, you ain't near as big as you think you are. Because my God said, you better prepare to meet God. You better brace yourself. Did you know that you cannot legislate yourself into righteousness? Did you know that we, you can't make enough laws to cause people to be right? We have the book of the law right here in our hand. And he's, he, listen, it's filled with mercy. It's filled with grace. It's filled with compassion. And God was saying to Israel, look at all that I've done for you. And yet they would not return to the Lord. And the Lord said through Amos, prepare to meet thy God. Oh, brother and sister, listen. I believe that God was saying to them, you have shaken your fist in my face long enough. Now brace yourself, stand to right, because you are going to face my judgment. When I think about that, my mind races to the many reasons that, that even people who say they're Christians just keep going headstrong into this world. Let me just say this to you. You cannot escape the judgment of God because the sovereign God has you in his grip. You cannot escape the sovereign God judgment. You cannot appeal because there is no higher court to appeal to than King Jesus. He is the almighty king. He is the almighty judge. There is no one else to appeal to. We will all face that judgment. Those of us who have forgotten the mighty miracles. And I think about the people of Israel. They had forgotten all about that, the goodness toward them. They had ignored the loving chastening of the Lord as he orchestrated or allowed catastrophic, catastrophic events to occur in their lives. And you might say, what do you mean? Isn't it amazing when you read the Word of God how that God, just by the very spoken word, could bring things upon the people of Israel that in, I believe in the heart of God was to cause them to stop and turn and repent. How many of y'all know that God is the author of all catastrophic events? Say amen. amen. There's not a wind that blows. You know what the Bible says? What manner of man is this? That even the winds and the waves obey his will. God brought or at least orchestrated many events to try to get the people of Israel to return. And I believe he's done the same in America today. And I know and you all agree that it is time that America prepare 
to meet our God. It's time that we brace ourselves for what is coming down the track. You see, we have had, even in recent, in recent years, we've had earthquakes in most unbelievable places. Guys, it, it, never, it never surprised me to read about earthquakes in California. That never surprised me at all. It never surprised me to, to open the newspaper or, or see on the news how, the, how the God was shaking the world in other parts of the world. But i, I got to tell you, I never, I never dreamed that we would have earthquakes in western Oklahoma. But we are in various places. Now, you might say, well, what does that have to do with anything? The Bible says that's part of what's going to happen in the last days. There's going to be things that we would have never imagined that are literally at the hand of God. We've had earthquakes. We've had volcanoes. We've had tsunamis. We've had floods and droughts and hurricanes. I heard on the news the other day that this, this year, 2020, we had more named hurricanes than any other year, I believe, since they've been keeping record. And one may say, boy, isn't that, I mean, isn't that just, uh, maybe, isn't that just coincidental with what's going on in America? You know what? I believe God is shaking this country. I believe that God is trying to say, it's time that you wake up, and if you don't return, you better brace yourself because God is is on the way. God's going to do something. You see, we've had man-made wickedness perpetrated against many of us at the hands of terrorists. We've had bombings and shootings and riots and burnings. We have COVID. How many of y'all know that, did you know that COVID is not even a surprise to God? Are y'all okay with that? It's not a surprise to God. I mean, God knew we may not know where it came from and all that, but, but God knows. And so all these things have happened, and one might say, well, why would such things come upon a, a, a great country like America that was founded on biblical principles? That's one of the reasons that they are coming upon America is because we were founded on biblical principle. We have enjoyed the great bounty of God. We have been prospered like no other nation and we're shaking our fist in his face. And he said, you better brace yourself. You better brace yourself. Listen, God's judgment is on the way. Did you know that I've had the I guess you could say fortune or misfortune of conversing with, with a couple of death row inmates. And do you know that, and I think it's probably pretty much common, basically their story will be something like this. You know, when I was, when I was young, I, I was a little bit mischievous, and you know, I'd get into a little bit of trouble, and, and somebody would give me a warning, and, and I'd straighten up for a little bit, and then I'd, you know, I'd just push the limit a little bit more. And I get in trouble, and, and there might be some kind of a penalty, but not much. And, and, and I'd get right, and then, and then I'd, I'd just keep pushing a little bit more and a little bit more. And I'd end up in court, and, and, and I, just, I just kept pushing. And as, as, even as God would send things into my life, and I, listen, I've had this told to me that should have awakened me, I just kept pressing. I just kept pressing a little further until one day you find yourself standing before a judge and the judge slams the hammer down and it's the death penalty. I believe that in many ways that's exactly what Amos was saying to Israel. He said, you better brace yourself. The hammer's getting ready to fall. And folks, I, I'm a very optimistic person. I think I, I want to be a very optimistic person. And it's, it's just like this. I mentioned this to the Sunday school class this morning. I got a text last night from a man. And he was very serious, not playing games, very serious. And his question was, are we all doomed? Are we all doomed? I was grateful that I could with great confidence and faith respond by saying, a true child of God is never doomed. But let me just say this. It rains on the just and the unjust. When the wind blows, it, it, listen, it blows at Brother Chet's house and it blows over at my house. 
when it's real hot in the summer, that, that hot sun beams down on my head just like it beams down on Brother Billy's head. And we live in a country, and God is saying, you better brace yourself, America. And so I would say to even those of you that are saved today, let's brace ourselves. How do we brace ourselves? By immersing ourselves in the blessed word of God. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still water. He restores my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. And yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil. My cup is running over. And surely, surely, Remember what, he, you remember what he was trying to pour out on Israel? He says, surely goodness and mercy will follow me. How long? All the days of my life. And then I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. God's people need to brace themselves by getting under the shelter of the Almighty. And those in this world, those in this country that are lost and perpetrating terror against God, I can simply say this to you. You better brace yourself because because judgment is coming and you cannot stop it. Judgment is coming and you cannot stop it. Oh, listen, we are to prepare to meet God. When I think about preparing, I also think about those that are saved. Now, I've said enough about our country. I'd like to say a lot more about our country. Did you know that if you're a child of God, that you have a command from God to pray for those who are in authority over you? Now, I know some of you go, now, preacher, wait a minute. <laughs> I mean, I don't like them. They're, we don't have anything in common. The Bible says, as a child of God, that we are to pray for those who are in authority over us. You want to make your enemy your friend? Win them to Christ. Pray for them. Lift them up to the Lord. Every one of us have that responsibility. And then I think about the word prepare. And those that are saved but living in a backslidden condition. I don't like the word backslide because it almost becomes an option for many Christians. It's almost like backslide is not really a bad word. Let me tell you, backslidden is an abomination to a holy God. Backslidden is literally us saying, no, God, no, God, no, God, and we just keep going backward, and the further we go, the easier it is to say no, and the harder it is for us to hear God. Backslidden is an abomination to God. When I think about prepare, I think about those that say they're saved, but their life doesn't indicate that truth. We need to make certain changes as we are prompted by the Holy Spirit of God this is the first Sunday in this new year. Some of you probably thought I was going to preach all about New Year's resolutions. Well, I've just got one. Prepare to meet thy God. Now, there's a whole bunch can come under that, but the greatest resolution you can make is for you in whatever state you are in to prepare to meet your God. You see... We need to resolve to follow our Savior. We sing a song that says, I am resolved to follow the Savior, leaving my sin and strife. He is the just one. He is the true one. He hath the words of life. We should resolve to follow him. That is one way that we can prepare. If we are saved but living for the world, if your interests are more aligned with the world than they are with the Word of God, you need to prepare. You need to get ready. You might say, Preacher, I just have a hard time sitting down and reading the Bible. And guys, I don't, listen, I, 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 I want to be very uh, transparent about that. It's not always easy for your pastor to take the time to sit down and get in the Word the way I know I should. Okay, are we okay with that? I, I, it, it's not the easiest thing to do. But I will say this, the more we practice that, the more we immerse ourselves in the Word of God, the more we will be drawn to the Word of God. I tell you, I got to read in Amos, and I, I, got, I, I just got flat excited to read it in the book of Amos. Uh, did you know if you'll go ahead and read the rest of that book, 
There's some things that are so interesting. Uh, I mentioned this a year or so ago. Let me mention it again. How many of you know, you got to be pretty old to know this because now everything is so high tech. How many of you know what an old plumb bob is? You know, we got some old folks here. I mean, uh, I, no reference to Jim, Brother Jerry. I just happened to look over your way. Uh, uh, a, a plumb line, a plumb bob. Did you, know that I, did you know that that didn't come about just in recent history? That Amos talked about that in the Word of God. You might say, now, how, how would he have talked about that in the Word of God? Well, you'll have to read Amos chapter 7. But here's what he basically said. He said, the, the, the statutes of God, the Word of God is like a plumb bomb. And I mean, it is straight up and down. And we want to be nicer than God. We want to say, you know what, I know that's where the line is, but, but you know, it really won't hurt. It won't hurt if we, just move, if we just move the line a little bit, and that's where we are. That's where America's at. That's where many Christians are. We have moved the line. We've ignored the absolute perpendicular, if you will, of the plumb line, and therefore we are in the mess that we are in, in our families, in our churches, in our nation, because we didn't pay attention to the plumb line. And once again, I, I share some things I know I've shared with you recently, but just maybe a year ago, I was, I was telling about our place over in Muskogee County. And uh, one of the high line poles, just before you get to the, to the gate, one of the high line poles was leaning way over. And if you really got to looking, you could find, you could see from the highway, there was a number of them leaning. And it was like, it was like the more they leaned, now this, this is really profound, listen. The more they leaned, the more they leaned. Do you know, do you know Christians are like that with sin? The more we give, the more we give. The, the more we lean toward the world, the more we lean toward the world at, at a point in time to where we can no longer stand upright. But as I was noticing one day, the electric company happened to be out there working. And they had this, this uh, it was like a bucket truck, but it had a deal you could push. And they, were, they had dug out around the poles and they were pushing them back up in, in line. And, and as they would do it, there was one guy on the ground. Now, I'm talking about just recently. And I know they've got all kind of equipment. And I mean high-tech equipment. They're the, they're the electric company. But do you know what I noticed? It was just astounding. There was one guy that would stand in a particular place, and he had a plumb line in his hand. Are you, I said, are you kidding me? I mean, surely he could have had some kind of a laser kind of, you know, a laser kind of, yeah, he had God's laser. He had a plumb line in his hand. And he would do like this. And he would hold that plumb line up. And can I tell you that's what God's doing today? God's holding the plumb line. In other words, his word that never changes, his word that stands perpendicular in a crazy world. And he's saying, move to the right, move to the, back, back up just a little bit. You know what he's trying to do? He's trying to get us to brace ourselves to prepare for that day that will come. So there's not only our nation, but there are those who say they're saved, but they're not living for the Lord Jesus Christ. I can think of a lot of practical ways that one may know that. Some of you probably think that these are my favorite sinful subjects to talk about. But I would encourage any of you to, uh, and I would say especially our young people, not only our young people, but any of you, did you know that I, if I had opportunity to look in your closet, I could probably tell you whether you are more aligned with the world or with the Word of God. How many of y'all are okay with that? Say amen. You know, I've been accused of being a clothesline preacher. I didn't know what that was. Early on in our ministry, I, we had a lady that got real upset at me. and She said, you're just a clothesline preacher. And so I, I, I was relatively ignorant. Some things don't change on that either, but I, I had to ask her what she meant. And uh, that, was, that was her answer that, um, you know, what a person wears doesn't mean anything. I want to tell you this. From out of the heart flow the issues of life. Did you know that God knows your heart? He also knows what's in your closet. But God knows your heart. And I've said this oftentimes, and I want you to just grasp this with me, if you will. David did not become an adulterer when he slept with Bathsheba. 
He was an adulterer in his mind, and then he just acted out what he was. Now, y'all okay with that? Now, in, in, in Psalms 32 and in Psalms 51, as well as when Nathan approached David, we know that David did the right thing. He cried out to God in true brokenness of spirit, and God forgave him of his sin and brought him back, if you will, into fellowship with God. But I'll just say this. We need to know, we need to understand that what is going on in our heart is displayed outwardly. Now, let me just go on to say this. If your daily conduct gives no evidence of your salvation, you need to prepare to meet God. You need to make preparation for that time that you will stand before the Lord Jesus. I've often, matter of fact, I mentioned this last Sunday. I got a lot of comments after the message uh, last Sunday evening uh, because I said something like this. Would all of your contacts on your social media, now I know this sounds a little arrogant, but that's okay. Would all of your contacts on social media meet with my approval? You might say, well, I don't care about you. I just care about God's approval. Well, what I mean by that is if I were to see all of your social media activity and I could take the Word of God, not my opinion, but the Word of God, and let the Word of God sift through that, would God be pleased? Would God be okay with what is on your social media and you might say, well, why are you going there? Because the Bible says, 2 Corinthians 5, 17, If any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new, even on social media. And so there are those that are listening today and maybe right here in this sanctuary that you do profess to be a Christian. You believe with all your heart that you're a Christian and only God knows your heart. But let me just say this. If you are saved... Are you allowing God to lead you in the path of righteousness? Are you allowing Him to lead you in the path of righteousness, or are you resisting God? I wonder if your conduct over the last couple of nights would please your God, your Heavenly Father. I wonder if that judgment day came, and you might say, yeah, but preacher, listen, I'm saved, and so the Bible says that I won't have to appear at the great white throne judgment. That is true. But if you're a child, how many of y'all are saved? Say amen. amen. The Bible says that you will stand at the judgment seat of Christ, and you will give an answer. The Bible says for every idle word, every thought, every deed, you will give account of. Every unrepented sin you will give account of according to the Word of God. Matthew 12, 36, the Bible says, But I say unto you that every idle word that men shall speak, they shall give account thereof in the day of judgment. If you're saved today, and I pray God that you are, but you're not being led in the path of righteousness. You're not, you're not walking in lockstep with God. You're more aligned with the world. Could this message, could you please just let this message be a call for you to get things right, to prepare because you never know when that day is coming for you? Death came for some of our church members very suddenly and very recently. I've buried a lot of young people in the last 35 years accidents, unbelievable things that happen. And, and not very often do you bury someone who was really, I guess you could say, prepared, except in a spiritual way. And when Jesus said on the cross, it is finished, he basically made it so easy for you and I. We have to ask God's forgiveness for our sin, invite Him to come into our heart and be the master of our lives. And in so doing so, that preparation is made, but then it is a daily walk 
as we stay in that state of preparedness. Romans 14, starting with verse number 10, the Bible says, For we should all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. So then every one of us shall give account of himself to God. Did you know that while this judgment is for believers only and there is no danger of our losing our salvation, many will be ashamed as they stand before the Lord. We will not be able to say like the Apostle Paul, I'm ready to be offered, the time of my departure is at hand. We will be ashamed. We'll be ashamed because we willfully and repeatedly and unrepentantly lived a life of sin. We'll be ashamed because we were adulterers and fornicators and covetous and pride and unforgiving, disobedient to the Word of God. We'll be ashamed. You may be saved. I think Brother Elder and I were in a conversation this morning and he said something to this effect. He said, I don't want to be like one that just gets in by the skin of my teeth. Why would that be your goal? Just to barely get into the kingdom of God. As a matter of fact, I, I have a, a, some concern for people that have that mentality. As long as, as long as I barely get in, I'm good. I would say to that mentality, there's a very good possibility that you've never really been to the cross of Calvary. If your attitude is, God, I want to live the way I want to live, and as long as I just, just before the door closes, if I get in, that's all that matters, you're probably not saved today. Because the desire of every Christian should be to honor the one who died for us. The one who gave his life for us. Many will stand ashamed before God at lost opportunities to share Christ with others. Many will be ashamed before God because he blessed you with talents and you were never willing to use the talents and the gifts that God has given to you. Many will stand ashamed. And I believe that there, at that point in time, there will probably be thoughts come to my mind of people that I had an opportunity to share Christ with and I made an excuse and did not do so. Guys, I, I just, let me camp there for just a moment and you know, the other day, and, and I've got to tell you, some of y'all, most of y'all, many of you probably think, it's easy for you and Clay, because y'all have the gift of gab, and, 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 I, and I don't disagree with that. Miss Deb thinks that we have uh, the gift. Lord probably thinks that Clay has the gift of gab, but guys, it's not that. I can gab all I want to, and it gets nowhere if I'm not gabbing about the right thing. But I love to share Christ with people, and, and, and he, he presents so many ways for us to share Christ. And then he makes it exciting along the way. I was driving down the road just the other day, and I saw a fellow working in a right up here on Texana Road. And so it was almost like, well, actually what had happened is a man in our church had handed me some money. And he said, give this to whoever you run into that needs this money. And so, uh, and that, that happens oftentimes um, with men in our church. So I'm driving down the road. I've got that on my mind. I see this young man working, and it was cold and rainy, and he was working out. And so I just pulled into the place where he was working. He came over uh, beside the truck, and I uh, started to introduce myself. Before I could get it all out, I said, I'm the pastor down at Lindsay Chapel. And, and he just backed away. That is not unusual. It's like, okay, that was, uh, what comes next? And he backed away, and uh, he said, I can't believe this. And I said, I, I didn't know what he's talking about. And so I asked him, he was a Christian. And he goes, yes, I'm a Christian. But he said, I can't believe this. And I'm going, well, I can't either, what is it? I can't believe it because I don't know what you're talking about. He opens his wallet, and I noticed there was no money in it. But as he opened his wallet, he pulled out a Lindsay Chapel church track that we have not used at this church in at least 10 or 12 years. We used to have little church tracks that were blank on the back, and I could write on them. 
and stick them on the door like, I know you're in there, but you would not let me in. You know, those tracks. Y'all remember those good old days when we had those? Or, well, I'm not going to say what. Anyway, and so he pulled this track out, and he goes, I've been carrying this around for a long time. He said, I don't even know where I got it. And he goes, what do you, it was almost like he was trying to get me to say, what do you think? Well, let me tell you what I thought. I thought, God was opening a door in a very interesting way for me to share the Word of God. Did you know that he didn't know what was written on the track? And so it gave me the opportunity. This was so good. He had the track. It was like he was saying to me, I've got the track. And I said, good, would you read that to me? And he shared the gospel with himself. Now, isn't that a wonderful thing? Before I left, I said, he said, why would you pull in here anyway? And I said, well, I reached in my pocket and I pulled out the money. And I said, well, I fell in my, and I told him what I just told you. And I said, I, I just believe the Lord wants you to have that. And tears rolled down his face. Now, guys, I want to tell you something. We that are saved have opportunity to help others get prepared to meet the Lord. Be concerned about yourself. Yes, you be concerned about yourself. You make sure that you are prepared to meet the Lord. But then don't hide it under a bushel, but let the light of Christ shine through you so that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. We have an opportunity to help others be prepared. But there will be many Christians that stand before God ashamed at the opportunities we, that we let slip right through our hands and never mentioned the name of Jesus. You see, we need to prepare. We need to judge ourselves that we be not judged. And then I want to close with this. I think about the word prepare for those of you that are here this morning and maybe those of you that are listening other places. When it comes to the lost... When it comes to those of you that may have never trusted Christ as the Lord and Savior of your life, when I think about that, I think about the importance of you making sure today. As I look out at you, I, I can see your outward appearance. And by your outward appearance, I can know something about your heart. But I am not God. And he is the only one that knows your eternal state today. He knows whether you are saved or lost. How do you know, preacher? Because he is omnipotent. He is all-powerful. He has all ability, literally in heaven and earth, to see right through all of that old flesh and know what's going on in your heart. Listen, he is the one who established the standard. He is the one who established the way. And he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no man comes to the Father except by me. He is the one who put, oh, I love this. He put all the planets in place, and he fixed the stars in the heavens, and he commanded the moon and the sun to shine. He hung the earth literally on nothing, and he holds it all together without any effort at all. Why do you need to prepare to meet God? Because He is that all-powerful God. Listen, we need to prepare because there's no place to hide from Him. He is all-seeing. He is omnipresent. Psalms 139, the Bible says, Where can I go from thy spirit? Where can I hide from you, God? And the answer is, you cannot hide from God. If you're not saved today, there's going to come a day that you will stand before God. And at that great white throne judgment for those that are lost, it won't be about your works. It won't be about um, opportunities you've lost. There'll be one thing going on at that great white throne judgment. It will be a separation 
from God. It will be a separation from all that is good. That's where many will cry, Lord, Lord, but have I not done these things? And the Lord will respond and say, Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. I never knew you. If you are not saved today, God extends a call for you to prepare to meet him. But it's not necessarily your preparation. It's what he did on the cross of Calvary. It's simply accepting. It's simply believing that his blood is the atonement for your sin. That's how we prepare, is by simply believing. I believe oftentimes it's important for us to go back to that old Roman road of salvation. If you're not saved today, and you're listening to this, you're not a child of God. Just let me take you back to that old Roman road that my pastor taught me many, many years ago. The Bible says, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Do you know I've witnessed to people before that had the attitude that they had really never done anything worthy of hell? Can I tell you this? You were conceived in sin. You were born in sin. We live in bodies made out of sinful flesh. And the Bible says, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. I believe that all of you that are in this building today and those of you who are listening at home, I believe that you are a good person. Good persons do not go to heaven. I believe that many of us by maybe our deeds and, and one, you, somebody could put a stamp on us, good old boy. But good old boys don't go to heaven. Only those who have accepted the Lord Jesus Christ. I want to be not nicer than God this morning. I want to be on God's side this morning. So I want to say to you, and I know this is so old-fashioned that some people are going to say, you know what, he's been preaching for 75 years. I mean, that old, same old thing over and over and over. Let me say this, it's not the same old thing over and over and over in our culture. But let me just say this to you, because I love you and Jesus died for you. You are, a. if you're not saved today, you are an unredeemed, unrepentant, poor, miserable, wretched, naked, and blind sinner, and hell will be your home if you don't make preparation to meet God. That's as nice as I can be. Did you know that the Bible says, but God commendeth his love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. You might say, well, why did you use that verse? It's in the Word of God. It, listen. But God commended his love toward us in that we, we were yet what? Say it with me. Sinners. Did you know that it's hard for people in America today to humble themselves and say, God, forgive me, a sinner. I am lost. I am helpless. I am hopeless. I am a sinner. God, forgive me. And listen, and pour out your mercy on me, God, and be the master of my life. It's hard for us to say I'm a sinner. We need to realize the Bible says the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God's eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Can I tell you this? You Today, you are either working for God or you're working for the devil. And if you're working for God, I'm not saying working to get to God. You can't do that. But if you're saved and you're working for God, listen, your wages are eternal life with Jesus Christ in glory. But if you're working for the devil, now some of you are saying, now wait a minute, preacher, it can't be that black and white. I don't want to be nicer than God now. There's only two kinds. They're the Christ rejectors and the Christ acceptors. And so the Bible says the wages of sin is death. In other words, if you're on the devil's payroll right now, listen, it... Your wages is going to be death. And I'm not talking about death and you're buried and that is over. I'm talking about an eternal death where the Bible says the worm never dies and there'll be weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth forever and ever in a fire that is never quenched. That's where you're going to spend eternity if you're not prepared to meet God. Some television preacher would probably say, now, preacher, more people would get saved if you just invite them into the body. 
I mean, more people would get saved, preacher, if you just tell them how much God loves them. Listen, I don't know that words can express how much God loves you, but He loves you so much. And there's got to be purity in the church. And there will be no sin in heaven. There will not be adulterers and fornicators and liars and covetous and perverts in heaven. And so what he's saying to us is acknowledge that you are that and, and, and allow my blood as the atonement for your sin and then you can enter into that eternal life spotless and blameless and above reproach. Listen. Being nicer than God is not necessarily a good thing. And then I would say this, if you're not saved today, the Bible says that if you will confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. The Bible says that with the mouth confession uh, is made unto salvation, but with the heart man believeth unto righteousness. Are you prepared to meet God I want to ask Miss Megan, if you will, to make your way to the piano. And I want to hit very quickly a few men in Scripture. You must not be like Felix in Acts chapter 24, who trembling, trembling as he heard the word of God from the mouth of the Apostle Paul. And the Bible says that Felix literally... I, you can read it in Acts 24. He trembled at the truth of the Word of God, but then he said, I'll call you back and hear you at a more convenient time. At a more convenient season, I'll hear you again. Did you know there's no record of Scripture that Felix ever got another chance? I believe that for Felix at that point, the wages of sin was death, and he is in an eternal hell today. Don't be like King Agrippa in Acts chapter 26 where he said to the apostle Paul after, the Paul, reasoned, after Paul reasoned with him with the gospel and Agrippa said this, Almost thou persuadest me to be a Christian. Did you know that Agrippa had the mindset that it was some kind of a game? Can you say enough? Can you do enough? Can you prove this? Can you prove that? You know what, Paul? You almost convinced me. Do you know what almost got Agrippa? almost got Agrippa the certainty of an eternal hell. Unprepared to meet God. Don't be like the rich young ruler in Luke chapter 18 who went away sorrowful because he was not willing to give up the things of the world in order to inherit the things of God. Many will cry out in that day. Many will cry out, but the Lord will say, Depart from me. So to our nation, I would say, if God, in His mercy and grace, might give us another season to repent, we must. But if not, America, you better brace yourself. You better get stood up right because there's something coming down the track that's going to overtake you. If you're saved today and you're more in line with the world than you are the Word of God. Prepare. Prepare. And if you're not saved, would you prepare? By this morning, walking down this aisle, listen, don't come down here and tell me how good you are. You can't get saved from a spirit of telling somebody how good you are. But maybe today you might walk the aisle and say to pastor or whoever we might have to counsel with you, I'm a sinner. I'm a sinner. And I want to ask God to forgive me of my sin, come into my heart, and be the ruler of my life. I want to be prepared to meet my God. Let's all stand together. If you need to come, the altars are open would you come? If you're not saved, if you're not saved, would you just make contact with me and I'll have somebody to pray with you that can share with you how you can know Jesus Christ as the Lord and the Savior of your life. If you already know how to be saved and the Holy Spirit of God has brought you here today, maybe you can kneel at that altar and cry out to God. You don't have to have somebody there with you, but if you'd like to have somebody, we'll pray with you. 
And then let me just give this other invitation. If you've been saved, you have given your life to the Lord. And you need to make that public. Listen, the Bible says, whosoever is saved will not be ashamed.